Okay, here we're continuing in ARC section 90A for the review of financial statements. And up until this point, we have performed um, analytics and inquiries and, and all of our uh, procedures for the review, and we've evaluated the results. And we've gotten a signed representation letter from management, and now we're ready to issue the review report. And so there are a lot of intricacies and modifications to the standard review report based on various circumstances. So the next several videos will discuss um, the review report and modifications that need to be made to it for certain circumstances. Um, so, you know, first we'll do the general um, review report requirements, and then we'll discuss some circumstances where uh, perhaps the client used a special purpose framework instead of a general purpose framework like that. Then we'll discuss um, implications of using comparative financial statements, communicating to management and others regarding fraud and non-compliance with laws. Then we have some other uh, emphasis of a matter or other matter paragraphs that we might include in the accounts review report for various circumstances. Um, how We'll discuss how we might disclose um, known departures from the applicable financial reporting framework in our review report, what to do when we are our report is restricted, what we need to say when the entity under review uh, might not be a going concern, what we might discuss related to subsequent events or subsequently um, discovered facts, how we might reference other accounts in our review report, and how to disclose the scope of our procedures related to supplementary information that's included with the financial statements, as well as required supplementary information that's required by um, the applicable accounting standards that are followed in the financial statements. So each of these um, specific circumstances would require us to modify our review report to discuss those items and make it known to the users of the financial statements that those situations are present, or to um, let the financial statement users know um, specifically the scope of the work that we did in relation to each of those items and what we did it to do. So in this first video in this little series, we will discuss the general requirements for reporting on the financial statements um, in our accounts review report. So first we see that that review report should be in writing and it should include the following statements. And there's a lot of them here and we'll briefly touch upon them here. There needs to be a title that includes the word independent. So it might say something like independent accountants uh, review report. We need to address it to someone at the entity that we reviewed. Uh, we also need an introductory paragraph that includes these points, and that this introductory paragraph should identify the entity um, for which financial statements were reviewed. It should state that we reviewed those financial statements. Uh, we should identify the financial statements. We should specify the period covered or the date covered by the financial statement. We can, should include a statement that says uh, a review um, is applies analytical procedures and inquiries, and we should notify the user of the financial statements in um, this introductory paragraph that the review is substantially less in scope than an audit and that we will not be expressing an opinion on the financial statements. Next, in our review report, we need to include this paragraph here with the heading Management's Responsibility for the Financial Statements. And it should include an explanation that management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements and that they're also responsible for the design, implementation, and maintenance of internal controls around uh, the preparation of those financial statements. And after management's responsibilities, we should um, include a section that we title Accountant's Responsibility. So this includes our responsibilities, and that section should include these two points, and that is our responsibility is to conduct the review in accordance with SARS, and that means that uh, we were objective of those standards is that we perform the procedures to obtain limited assurance for basis for reporting whether we're aware of any material modifications that should be made. And we should also state in this section that we believe the results of our procedures provide a reasonable basis for our conclusion. And next, after that section about our responsibilities, there should be a section that uh, concludes and states whether we're aware of any material modifications that should be made to the financial statements based on the results of our procedures. Then we should have our signature or the, the, the firm's signature. We should include the city and state where we practice. And we should also include a date of the review report, which we spoke about in detail in the last video. But basically the report should not be dated um, earlier than the date on which we completed our procedures. Now in relation to this, we have a lot of explanatory material that goes into a little more detail of how to include each of these, um, these statements into our review report. So we can go and look at those now. We've got A68, 69, through 72, also A80 here, A73, A49, A77, and through A79. Uh, so we'll go down to those sections now and get a better understanding of how to include these statements in our review report. Okay, so here we're in the explanatory material, continuing our discussion of the general requirements for um, the inclusions in our accountant's review report. And so they suggest here that we might include a footnote on each page of the financial statements that we reviewed that way, if somehow our review report becomes detached from the financial statements, a reader of the financial statements would see this footnote referring to our review report, and they would know to find the review report, which would temper their reliance on 
the reviewed financial statement. So you need to include that put in, under each uh, in, in each page of the financial statement. Also, they tell us here that uh, if we're unable to perform all of our analytics or inquiries, or um, if management doesn't provide us a representation letter, then our review is incomplete, and therefore we can't issue a review report. So next, regarding the title of the report, they give us a, an example to use. Um, we remember from the requirements that we just discussed, it has to include the word independent. Um, and so they tell us that maybe we should say independent accountants review report. Um, as far as the addressee of the report goes, we see that the report's usually addressed to whoever uh, we are performing the engagement for. So for instance, to the entity whose financial statements are being reviewed or to those charged with governance. And if it's a more closely held entity, we might address it to the partners, the general partner, or the proprietor. And if it turns out that we are performing engagement for an entity that's not the client, um, then we should address the report to the, that entity and not to those charged with governance of uh, the entity. So next, we'll provide some more color on the introductory paragraph. We remember this This basically tells us uh, what financial statements are being reviewed, what period is, un, is covered, and the entity that um, is covered in the financial statements, etc. So they've got an example sentence here. It is that um, we reviewed the accompanying financial statements of ABC, which comprised the balance sheet as of that date, and related statements of income changes and stockholders' equity and cash flows for the year, and related notes to the financial statements. So that includes all the elements that were in the requirements that we saw before. And also, if it turns out that our review report and financial statements are included with uh, a much larger document, we might um, make note the page numbers in that document where each of our uh, report and or where, where each of the financial statements are included and the notes to the financial statements. That way, the readers of that big report will be able to find the, uh, the statements that we're referencing in our introductory paragraph. And next, we have management's responsibilities. We remember, those are basically the responsibility for the fair presentation of the financial statements and for the internal controls. And they say here that by us describing management's responsibilities in our review report, um, it helps explain to the users the premise on which a review is conducted. And so we, we see this premise throughout um, this entire ARC section 90A, including in the um, developing the terms of the engagement in our engagement letter and the client acceptance and our continuous responsibilities we have as well. So next, in regard to our accountant's review report, we have a section on the accountant's responsibility. And so that is that our, we have a responsibility to perform the engagement in accordance with SARS. And this, this provides a contrast to management's responsibility that uh, management is responsible for the financial statements, um, as we saw. And uh, we are only responsible for performing the review engagement in accordance with SARS. So it's important that we make that distinction in the, the review report. And also by referencing SARS, we are telling the user of the financial statements that we have conducted this engagement in accordance with established standards. And we didn't just, uh, just make stuff up as we went along. We actually had some structure to what we were doing. And finally, we're not allowed to represent that we complied with SARS in our review report unless we did comply with all relevant requirements within the bodies of SARS. And next, regarding the accountant's address, we remember in the requirement we're supposed to include the city and state. Um, but it says here that we can um, indicate the city and state on our letterhead. So we don't necessarily have to say the city and state at the bottom of the uh, review report. Um, it, it's okay for us to just have the city and state in our letterhead, but you'll see most reports by most firms will include a city and state um, at the bottom under the, uh, under the review report and the signature. And next, we have the date of the accounts review report, and we went deep into detail on that in the, or at least with the representation letter in the prior video, but we have some more information here. And they tell us that we can go to 71 through 77 for some more information about subsequent events, because this accounts review report says that uh, we consider the effect of events and transactions up until the date of our review report. So we want to make sure that we've performed all procedures um, before we uh, sign and date this review report, including procedures um, over um, periods after the entity's year end and through the date of our uh, review report date. And also it says that in order for us to conclude that we have attained limited assurance as a basis for reporting, um, there are no material modifications that should be made, then we need to make sure that we've performed all the procedures that we're required to do. And that includes obtaining the evidence um, for all of the statements in the financial statements, as well as the related notes to the financial statements. And that management has a set of responsibility for them, for instance, in the um, representation letter. And so finally at exhibit C, we have some illustrations of review reports on financial statements that incorporate all these general requirements as well as additional requirements um, in the next that we will discuss in the next several videos. But for now, we can go down to Exhibit C and look at the general structure of the accountant's review report. Okay, so we're now in Exhibit C uh, with some illustrations of accountant's review reports. And as we discussed, there's a lot of specific requirements for specific situations. So we have a lot of illustrations here, um, and we'll probably look at the, each of these in turn um, for each of the specific situations. But this one right here is for the general review report, and this one uh, reports that there's a single year of financial statements instead of comparative years. Um, this one has a tax basis of accounting um, rather than gap and there are specific situations of the other so for this um, particular video let's look at illustration one which is sort of a, a vanilla um, review engagement where we have comparative financial statements 
in accordance with GAAP, and a review was performed for both years of financial statements that are included. So here we have illustration one, and let's check it for each of the requirements um, that we just discussed. We see here there's a title that uh, says independent. We have an appropriate address, addressee here. We, uh, it says that we reviewed these particular financial statements of this company. For instance, the balance sheet tells us the periods that were covered in our review. Um, and here it names each of the financial statements that were under review. It says that the review is applying analytical procedures and inquiries. And it explains that uh, the review is less in scope than an audit and that we don't express an opinion as part of this report. Then it includes management's responsibilities with the title to, the, to that effect, um, which uh, includes management's responsibility for the presentation and fair or preparation fair presentation of the financial statements, as well as uh, the internal controls. Then it tells our responsibility with an appropriately named title, uh, which includes that we are required to uh, perform the engagement in accordance with SARS, or that rather that we did perform it in accordance with SARS. And then it tells what the engagement's objective is, um, as well as our belief that the procedures we performed were adequate for um, coming to the conclusion, which we discussed here, the accountant's conclusion. It says that based on our review, we're not aware, or we are aware, of um, material modifications that could be made to the financial statements to put it in accordance with um, CAP. And so then we have our signature, our city and state, and the date of the accountant's review report. So that's it. That's our, our general uh, template for an accountant's review report. And if everything goes well with the engagement and um, it's a pretty straightforward review engagement, then this will be it. But as we discussed earlier with each um, different specific situation, we might have to modify the review report to make note of those um, differences. And we will discuss those different modifications in the next several videos.